My experience of ChatGTP is having been a creative director and stuff like that is it's kind of like um, it's kind of like a a junior copywriter who's not really very good. And machines don't see anything; they're doing math over letters, right? I believe copywriters and creatives should be brainstorming off of data. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Sam Knowles. I'm so excited about our guest on this episode of Data Malarkey. Joining us from Whitmore Lake near Detroit, Michigan, is Les Guessing, a 360-degree creative and marketer, an Emmy award-winning copywriter, video virtuoso, and self-professed data fool. He describes himself as a creative director with a passion, some would say a personality disorder, for using aspects of data, data science, Les, they're your words, data, data science, machine learning, and AI to make advertising and creative better and more impactful. Amen to that, I say. Um, I first came across Les in an interview he gave earlier this year to the Data Driven Decision Making blog, whose creator, Elizabeth Press, has been a recent guest on the podcast. Um, on his website is perhaps one of the longest and most impressive resumes, that's CVs to our British listeners, that I think I've ever seen. It's a full 34-page PDF. Les, welcome to the Data Malarkey podcast. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate that. That's a fantastic lead-in. Uh, well, listen. I, well, I'm sure to disappoint. <laughs> well, listen, uh, it's great to have you join us. I want to uh, check that that is a good summary of who you are and what you do. Is there anything that you'd like to add, anything that you think I w I've got wrong in, your, in the description of you there? Uh, I think that's, that's pretty good, you know? I mean, I, I, I am uh, kind of ADHD in that sense that I'm scattered in a lot of directions, and you seem to touch all of them, or most of them anyway, so... Very good indeed. Now, listen, before we get down and dirty with data, uh, let's go beyond that 34-page that resume and let's start with a question that's designed to get to the heart of you. It doesn't necessarily ask you to tell us about your job. It could do. But tell us, Les, how do you spend your time? You know, uh, that depends on what part of my life you caught me in. But right now, really, you know, uh, I'm writing for people and freelancing some. But I'm, I'm, I'm very passionate about what's going on in AI and data. So, and it's almost like an overwhelming amount of stuff, particularly recently. It always has been. It's been this wide array, but it's almost like this overwhelming amount of stuff to learn and study. And part of that 34-page resume is classes and courses I've taken, really. And I'm kind of an autodidact addict. I like to learn. Uh, I, I should I should learn to turn it into money, but. Uh, but I'm very fascinated by that. So I spend a lot of my time, I get up in the morning, and, and really this has been a thing all my life, to, to get up in the morning and study things I'm interested in and pursue things I'm interested in. And uh, as Victor Frankl said, you know, success ensues. And I, and I hope it does. Very, very, very good. You're not the first person uh, I've spoken on this podcast, and I'm sure you won't be the last um, to quote Frankel, but uh, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a lovely, lovely, lovely application of it. Now tell me, what, what role does data play in your day-to-day -day work as a 360-degree marketer? Uh, more and more and more. I mean, it's it's been really interesting. I mean, I have a little bit of a backstory as to how I got into data. I didn't go, oh, I'm going to go study data. But um over the years, uh, it has become more and more and more. I kind of got into it to do this quick, funny thing, and then it's, it's seven or 10 years later, I'm still working on it. I'm not sure if it's seven or 10 years because there was a period where I was drinking and smoking a lot of weed, but, uh, but I think it's somewhere between seven and 10. Uh, but really, just about everything I'm up to now or everything I'm interested in, even the writing, and that, I think that's really my forte is how do I combine copywriting and advertising writing, which I've been really successful at, with data and, and AI stuff that's going on now, but even deeper than that. And that's that's been my passion and it's hard and it may be the rest of my life, you know? And tell us what, what I mean, uh, I'm sure that you have, you have given the number of different courses, the number of different applications that you're, you're, you're learning to kind of to, to, to master all the time. Uh, I, I love the description, yours, the, that description as an autodidact addict. That's fantastic. Um, what, what, what kind of data is the most important to you in your work, would you say? You no, know, and this is partly how I wound up in, in data. I've been very interested in language really for a long time. I mean, that's what brought me into this. And I studied hypnosis, which has to do with language for about 20 years. And that led me into this. And so natural language processing 
which is NLP, is about data. Though for a long time, I actually studied NLP, which is neuro linguistic programming, which is about linguistics and about hypnosis and a lot of stuff like that. And that kind of led me to this. So I do also think tabular data is fantastic. I'm really big on, I believe copywriters and creatives should be brainstorming off of data, whether it's tabular data, Google Analytics 4 data, or mining text, which is something I'm super interested in. That's really, really, really interesting. I mean, I've hung around in various corners of marketing communications, content development for almost 35 years now. Uh, and I have to say that I, I, I feel that you are somewhat of an outlier when it comes to fusing creativity with data. There's, there's, there's this. I mean, you're, you're you know, you're, you're an ideal uh, guest for a, for a, a podcast that's about using data smarter. But, but. You know, my, uh, for, for a long time, I don't know if, the, if this phrase ever crossed the pond, but for a long time, uh, marketing was described as the colouring in department. Um, oh, I haven't heard of it. Yeah, that's. Uh, right. I, I mean, I, yeah, I think it's moved um, in in many ways. It's moved a long way beyond that. But of course, for 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 for, for a lot of its time, you know, going back to John Wanamaker, the the American department store owner, don't know which uh, half my, my advertising spend is wasted. Well, I mean, we don't need to worry about that now because those bright econometricians are able to build the cause and effect models that that tell us. That actually, this creative or, or or that channel's working, but but you, you've you, you've hinted that that there was a project that, that got you into this seven to ten years ago. Why are you so uh, as such an enthusiast for data, data science, uh, and AI? Where does where does that that passion and that and that spark come from? So uh, I've always liked comedy and comedians, and uh, I, I'm I'm a wildly unsuccessful screenwriter. I wrote nine screenplays. I sold squat. Uh, that's how come I moved to Los Angeles. I live in Michigan now. But uh, I would freelance and then I would write screenplays. It was a wonderful lifestyle. Uh, <clears throat> but one of the things I did in studying neurolinguistic programming, that NLP, mm -hmm. was the goal of that was to build models, build models, mental models. And not sure they ever exactly achieved that. Their, their metaphor was kind of like the human brain is a computer. And that has its limits, but it was very it was very helpful in making me think that way, you know. And so one of my best friends taught stand up comedy. He was actually a graduate of Clown College, and we used to talk about building a model of comedy. And like, you know, it's interesting if you think about it. You know, you and I just you know don't know each other all that well. We're in the same room. We hear a joke. We both laugh. How is that possible? Thirty, forty, fifty people. Everybody will laugh, or most of them will, because we recognize that there are some underlying algorithm to a type of joke. And you can sort of recognize that, but nobody has sort of formalized that. And in a way, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like bad to analyze comedy in a way because it just destroys it. So he and I used to talk about this and um, and then, you know, we, we've kind of gone our separate ways, but, but it was something that really intrigued me. And then one day uh, I was working on a project, but I started to... Uh, try to write out, okay, well, what is this? Is this thing I'm thinking about, right? And I started making little arrow kind of things, which are actually sort of vectors. And, um, you know, I was on the math team in the seventh or eighth grade, so I knew a little bit about math. But honestly, I recently took a test, and I tested at the fifth grade level in math. So <laughs> I'm not a math wizard. Uh, but I, was, I remember distinctly because I was in a restaurant, and I started drawing these things, and I thought, wow, you know, that, that's math. I mean, these things are little algorithms. I didn't quite know what algorithm was. And I thought, wow, that, you know, that's really interesting, you know, that, that, you know, there are different things in different ways that you could mathematically summarize, right? And uh, so I took a little while and did, and I looked around the restaurant at that point because I was like, oh, no, I, I'm not smart enough to think about this stuff. What, I mean, literally, I was like a little like, oh, no, am, am I going crazy, you know? And then I started to explore it, and uh, I wrote a book. I wrote it out handwritten, which I'm actually trying now to turn into uh, text using digital stuff. But uh, so I have about what might be considered like 80 algorithms. And um, and I can sort of tell you one. I don't want to tell you the whole IP, but I can tell you how, how it works. But if you think about like Stephen Wright's a good person to do this because um, he like if, if he like he, he'll have a joke. He has a joke structure. Or one of these algorithms is, is kind of applies it to itself. So if you think about like uh, he has a joke. Uh, I used to work work at a fire hydrant company. You can't park anywhere near the place, right? Cute joke, but you can sort of. But but there's another joke, which is if you're writing with invisible ink, how do you know when you're out, right? And so 
those two jokes in a series of jokes have a lot of the same structure, and that is it takes a quality of that thing and applies it to itself. And then so there are about 80 different types of those. And then just like in machine learning, a lot of times what you get ultimately from a comedian is not a structure of a joke, but an ensemble of a joke. You know, there's four or five of these things, so it makes it hard to kind of figure out. So I spent quite a bit of time writing all this up, and that's all I did for a few weeks. It was sort of (laughs) this kind of crazy time of my life. Um, And then I thought, well, can I write jokes from this? And you know what? I can. I used it to show that I could write jokes, but it is very left brain, right brain, and it breaks my brain to do it. I mean, it's, you know, it's hard to analyze. I mean, that's one of the things I'm good at is using the data and data analysis is very logical with sort of creative stuff, right? And so I've had it around for a long time and not sure what to do with it, but it got me into thinking about, well, how can I make something out of this? How can I make an app out of this or something? And that got me into programming. Um, uh, early on, I actually tried to steal a program from somebody. I didn't know how programs worked. I bought his, I bought his software thinking the program would be there. I didn't program so just slowly, I started doing more and more. I brought, uh, I bought, you know, I started learning to program and Python and R and SQL and some stuff like that. And that was super hard for me. I'm not a great programmer, uh, but that led me into data science. And about the time that happened, data science was really kicking its heels up. You know, um, I started to go into meetups. I, I went to UCLA for cinematography and I shoot videos. So I would go shoot videos of these meetups. And I helped, not really found, but I was one of the initial members of Data Science Los Angeles. And that was maybe 10 years ago. And at the time, it was so early on in this revolution, probably about the time of ImageNet, that um, that people, um, you know, were, were basically reading their PhD thesis. That would be the, that would be the meetup. It wasn't, you know. Uh, and then it just exploded. And then there's more and more and more. So that's what kind of led me into it. And now particularly with large language models and uh, how attention works, I'm realizing, wow, okay, this will work for the kind of thing I've been carrying around in a notebook for about 20 years. This sort of a long winded very good. But how, how very interesting. I, I'm really interested in. Um, I, I, I've written and I, 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 I teach and train in uh, insight and insightful thinking, and so joining together uh, things that haven't been put together uh, before in, in, to, to have genuine breakthroughs. Um, and one of the things I encourage people to do um, uh, as a, an exercise in, in flexing their creative muscles is to watch and dissect comedy and to try and make sense of comedy. Um, and that, you know, that switcheroo, you know, it's a very easy, it's a very old thing, but the switcheroo, you're going down one path, something is called back from before, and it completely flips on it, its head. That, I think, is not dissimilar to what happens when we join old and old together and, uh, and make something new. Um, I want to talk to you about, I want to talk to you about this, I mean, this, it's such an exciting time uh, with, you know, from ChatGPT, well, maybe not Bard. My, my experiments with Bard so far have been a bit disappointing, but but from ChatGPT and Dali and AI Valley and Paper Cup and Glass and all of this stuff there is. Just be, ju- just before I wa- you talk, I, I want to I ask you about your experiences and you think the opportunities there. Um, one of the things that I've been disappointed in, and maybe I'm pushing the wrong buttons, one of the things I've been disappointed in is particularly Chan GPT's ability with humor uh, and its ability to be funny and its ability to, to do puns. Now, I read a really interesting article, I'll put in the show notes, uh, from a guy from NYU who said that the reason that, that, that AI as it is today is not good is because it is very much all about convergent rather than convergent and divergent thinking but i uh, so so convergent you know you you make choices you you take choices you make choices because it's always reducing down it's that's one of the reasons why it's so bad at humor um do you uh, have you experimented with 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 any of the 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 the, the tools the chat gpt others uh, in uh, in humor so that's a great question. So here's uh, here's what my take is. I think in, in general, well, you know, you, t- you teach about insight and you train about insight. Yep. But insight is a very human thing. Right? It is. It's not something machines don't have insights because insight means I see into something, yep. right? And uh, and machines don't see anything. They're doing math over letters, right? So So they don't really have that insight and they don't have the shared experience that, 
we have as sort of North American English speakers or whatever, right? And that includes the British, even though you have a different language. Uh, <laughs> but funny, I went to I actually traveled to England for a little while and applied for some jobs there. And I realized I probably couldn't do copywriting in English because you have a different, so much of advertising is uh, colloquialisms and metaphors and stuff like that. that and and I, I don't know English metaphors. You do great advertising. But I know when I was in England, somebody said, let's go for a lay in the park. And I thought, yeah, well, <laughs> where, where's this park <laughs> that you can get laid in? Uh, but uh, but yeah, uh, I, I, I think, and I've only just, I can't even speak about Bard, really. I did do something with Dolly two years ago that's on my website. It's kind of a joke because it's so absolutely horrible two years ago. It, it looks like bizarre, distorted, psychedelic acid images if you look on my website under the About Me. But but uh, I, my experience of chat GTP is having been a creative director and stuff like that. Is it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like a, a junior copywriter who's not really very good, though occasionally hits it out of the park. And, uh, and, but it's certainly, and, th and this gives me great hope. This is partly why I'm so now going, wow, I got to do this. Because it doesn't do humor. It does like dad jokes and puns and stuff like that. But that's kind of ripped off the web. And it's, I think it's, it's, it's a part of my model, but it's way now, right? But it doesn't have that, that experience. And this is as a writer and, you know, for comedy, that comes from experience. And that sort of flipping it on its head thing, it doesn't flip things on its head. It doesn't know. However, I believe that what attention is, when you vectorize these things in space, it puts it in a space, right? Like it puts a certain phrase or words in space. And this model that I'm working on sort of tells you which direction in that attention space to move to. Because that's sort of the trick, like what you were saying was, I, you know, uh, you, you know, you you move from what you you lead people with beliefs, which was part of NLP, to believe something, and then you twist it, right? Well, what's that twist? How do you get to that twist? And that's a lot of what my model is about, and why I think uh, now is the time to do that with with attention models. And uh, it, I was like, wow, okay, I, I get how that works, you know. Now, if I can make it happen, because it's it's not an easy feat. Did I answer the question? That makes sense. You certainly did. You absolutely did, and uh, and several more besides. Um, when you talk about uh, you know accessing the the, the different um, structure and, and, and different ways of thinking in your brain, um, uh, left and right, and so on, do do, do you feel that data driven creativity is superior to creativity that isn't underpinned by data? Uh. So much superior, but so we'll tell you this. So when I started in advertising, which was quite a while ago, it was sort of a fantastic time to be in advertising because there was very little measurement, right? The only real measure of whether something was good was, uh, is it going to win an award? <laughs> you know, so that was like King Hell Holiday for for creative people because, no, but, you know, now data is kind of used to kill people's ads and stuff like that, right? So, um, but, um, you know, now it has evolved into you can measure all kinds of stuff, too much stuff. And and I love that. I do love that, though it was quite fun to be in advertising and and when it was in that era because we were the kings, right? And now it's, it's you know, it, but what I feel like is the next era of advertising for copywriters and for creative people. And there's a lot of stuff right now with here's this tool and here's this tool, and they're fantastic. But that insight that you talk about is really the money. You know, it's, I mean, the what the tools do is is execution of stuff, is produce stuff. But what you put in there, which is what's called a prompt, right, is uh, is the thing that you comes from you. In other words, if I put a good setup for a joke in there, or I put in something that's interesting, I, I did improv for about five or six years, and I was not good at it. I did it to try to get out of my head. But a prompt is really kind of like you know, where you go to the audience and you say, okay, uh, give me something in your garage and tell me what kind of pirate I am. And then you have to make a, a scene out of it, right? And and that's kind of what a prompt is. And that's what data is. You know, data is an observation recorded in the world of something at a certain point in time. And if you think about Jerry Seinfeld, that's what Seinfeld does. He observes stuff and he goes, you ever notice? And then he goes into what he noticed. And so, um, uh, 
there's actually a, a great, and I didn't take this from him, but he does a great thing called uh, I, Heart Quant, uh, I Quant New York. And he takes data and he did improv and he turned it into things. And so I'm not sure if he's still around, but he has some videos on the web. But like, for instance, he figured out like, what's the one, he used data to figure out what's the one parking space that gets the most tickets in all of New York, right? So there's, there's fun stuff with data like that, that I think makes the creative better. But you know, if you talk to data scientists, and I know a lot of them, and some of them are pretty funny, but some of them are not, a lot of them, you know, because they have this wonderful logical kind of thing. So uh, to, to be able to, to take that data and not just sort of do linear regression with it or project something out, but to make something funny out of it is really what creative people should do. And you can think about it like from Burbach, and I'm kind of going on here, but, you know, Burbach's idea was, was, Let's, you know, you had copywriters and you had art director people and they'd go slide copy under the door to the art director. And he'd draw it up. And Birnbach said, let's put these people in a room and uh, and make them uh, hang out together and come up with stuff together. And that's a little bit of uh, my relationship to Chad GPT, right? As I go, hey, I got this idea. And if I don't give it anything interesting to think about, it doesn't really come up with anything. Kind of like my art director partner a lot of times, you know? But like, for instance, a, a little while ago, I gave it uh, the notion that I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. I said, okay, so write me an intro for a country song, the way country music artists go. There's a little song I wrote about, you know, and it kind of goes into this thing. Write that, but then write me a song about two robots in love. Now, ChatGPT wrote a really funny thing and a good country song and a great funny country music intro. To that, I go, yeah, I'll tell you a little story about two robots. I mean, this beautiful little story you wrote, but without me, it's not going to write that, right? And that's what creative people do. And I think that's what they do with these tools. And that's what they do when they actually can explore the data themselves. I, I completely love your analogy. I'd never, I would never have occurred to me. I love your analogy of Burnback putting uh, copy, copywriters and art directors together as being, you know, 60 years down the road 70 years down the road is 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 data and creativity i think that's a, that's a beautiful notion Thank you. Why, why i mean why do you think there aren't more people in the creative world in the advertising world who share our passion for for data driven narratives do you think do you think it's just because people are different sorts what why, why, why aren't there why aren't there more people like us less you know you know what i mean it's it's been a really interesting thing because like the last six months everybody wants to talk about data People used to laugh at me. People called me a dilettante. People called me all kinds of names or people would say, you just want to take our fucking jobs, you know? And I mean, it was really, it was not a friendly, and I mean, I, I kind of feel like hitting in a way, like I've just been staying with this though. People just tell me I'm stupid for doing it, you know? And I've always sort of felt like well, there's, there's something really here. And then the last six months, it's like everybody's going, oh, AI, hey, man, machine learning. Yeah. You know, but, but when, when I would do this before, if I talked, try to talk to somebody, I was kind of like, the insurance salesman at a party, right? Where people would go, uh, stay right there. I'm going to go get a drink. And then they never come back, you know? So I think what's happened has caused it to explode and people start to go, though they have not really gotten into data in the sense that we talk about it. It's more so far about the tools and, and all the sort of executional stuff you can do. And what I'm saying is I think some of the best parts of it come from before you do the execution. Or how you come up with that idea for a prompt or that uh, uh, data for a prompt. And also, well, one other thing that I think is important is mostly data has been used to kill people's work, right? You know, inside agencies, a lot of times what happens is people, you know, creative people do these amazing ads and then and then some planner or some account person goes, well, you know, the data says, and if you don't know data, which most of them don't, or you don't do R or Python or something like that, what are you going to say? You, you can't argue with them. You can't say, well, let's look at your data, you know? And so it has kind of been used to, so there's really this two silos and kind of this love, hate thing between, uh, between or mostly hate, hate, hate thing inside agencies that, uh, that they've been dealing with for a long time. Mm -hmm. But I, I hope, I hope to change that some. I, th I think, I think the very interest that people have been showing in the last six months um, uh, speaks that, that that you know you were right to be there all along. It's just that, that they've taken time to to catch up. In terms of the data that 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 you use, 
do you face challenges in making sure that it's useful to you, either in terms of it being clean or intact or usable? Um, are there any ch- are there challenges that that you face in particular? Uh, I think it's it's very challenging, and it's probably been so challenging that I don't think I've actually executed it the way I am. And I mean, you know, data data comes in dirty. It comes in, you know, what is good data or it's massive. How do you figure out what to do with it? And then uh, ad agencies and companies sort of have this mentality for creative people like, okay, let's see something by five o'clock, <laughs> you know, and that's not how it works. You know that, right? I mean, it can take a while to do this. And I know for a while there, a lot of agencies hired data scientists and then didn't know what to do with it, but didn't know how to screw that into something, which is what I do. So that is a problem though. A lot of that has been really sped up too, you know. Uh, One of the things I'm very big on for creative people are things like AWS, AutoML, and things like that because, you know, Google Cloud, you can dump a bunch of data in there and it will decide if it's a classification problem or a regression problem and it it will run machine learning on it. So I think there's a lot of that kind of thing happening. It will clean your data, a lot of stuff like that. So uh, I think that's changing, but it is it is a barrier to it. And people really want to see something quick, partly because just money, you know, funds inside of an agency have been shrinking as well. I think you're you're, you're absolutely right about about particularly agencies hiring data scientists and not knowing what to do with them, how to talk to them, how to motivate them. Um, I, I think that is slowly changing, but I think it requires kind of simultaneous translation or uh, pro- probably it requires AI to, to, to help solve that problem. Now, listen, I've got to ask, um, what was the campaign that you won your Emmy for? Tell us about it. And were there some good after parties as well? <laughs> so that's an interesting thing. So uh, uh, I grew up in the South where it's mandatory to play football and baseball and sports, right? So I was been on team since I was about four years old and I wasn't really a great athlete, but I played on them. So I liked sports. And then uh, I had worked for a movie agency, actually Tony Sleiniger, the guy who did the ET poster, got asked to pitch uh, the NFL on Fox when Fox got football many years ago, right? And, uh, and so uh, we pitched against Deutsch, Donnie Deutsch's agency, who drove up in a big uh, uh, bunch of limos, which the client didn't really like, you know. <laughs> and then and then we pitched against uh, Saatchi, which did some really terrible work. I, I mean, almost funny, bad. I mean, I work for Saatchi. They do incredible stuff. But what they did. So we kind of won by default. And then I was just freelance. And so they asked me to, to work on this account. And uh, actually, the OJ trial was on at the time. And so I said, I don't want to go into an office. And partly because I was watching the OJ trial. <laughs> so I would write in the morning and write in the, at lunch and in the evenings. And, uh, and, we, and what, what was really fun about it was, you know, when you use celebrity athletes, it cost a fortune. But we had a guy who used, who was a cinematographer, but used to play tight end for the San Diego uh, Chargers. And he knew these guys. So how it would work is they would say, hey, uh, hey, we got Emmett Smith tomorrow on a golf course. Write something funny. And it was really fun because it wasn't like, oh, you got to talk about cup holders and engine CCs and things like that. Just write a funny joke. And, um, and I knew football well enough to do that. So we, we, we did that. And then the truth is they don't really, now they do give copywriters uh, Emmys. But at the time, you, you had to be a producer. So I was a copywriter producer on that. That's how we built it. And I worked with a couple of guys, a few guys who were just fantastic and loved sports. One of the most fun jobs I ever had. And then they submitted it, actually, because I would never have thought to do that. And uh, and we tied Wyden and Kennedy, who, of course, is famous for their sports work. He had got an Emmy. And so uh, it was kind of shocking and funny. And then you have to pay for your own Emmy, which I was sort of surprised by. I was like, okay, really? You can't just give me an Emmy. But, uh, but yeah, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, we did some really fun work. Some of it is on my website. But the real benefit of it is, is it is my resume. I mean, I could just sort of say, oh, what an Emmy. And, you know, even though it may not be the best, but it's some pretty good work uh, work I ever did. It, it's like a one-sentence sort of thing. Like, oh, okay, he's obviously talented. So that's been a benefit of it. Very good. You're not, you're not revealing if there are any after parties. I guess if you had to pay for the Emmy itself, you were probably paying for your drinks as well, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what happened was we didn't go to the Emmy and it was sort of a shocker that we won. I, I don't even know if I was aware they had entered us into the competition, right? Uh, we had a couple other uh, 
creative directors and really great writers on there. And they had this idea to do this thing. I probably wouldn't have thought about it, but, um, but yeah, it was actually, it was quite a bit of fun though. And we were, we were just over head over heels that we had won this thing. And, and, you know, I have a, I have a shrine in my house where the Emmy sits and it's lit, you know, if you go to my Instagram, you'll see a thousand pictures. Oh, here I am with my Emmy. No, no. <laughs> yes, here we here we are going for a drive together. Here we are having a picnic. Here we are at the Grand Canyon, uh, yep. me and Miami. Very good. You know, it's funny you say that because there was a period when I was moving and I didn't want the movers to move it. So I had it in my car. And so I just started to take it in wherever I went. If I went to like a restaurant, I'd bring it to the table. i take it to the bar. And it was sort of a funny time of my life. Very good. Now, listen. Thinking about thinking about effective communication. Um, when you spend your time steeped in data uh, and making sense of data and using data as the as the, as maybe the creative spark, what do you think is the best way of combining narrative and numbers in storytelling? Do you have a, do you have any ru- rules that you follow for that? Uh, so much rules and this is the hard part of it and why i want creative people to do it because it is the way they think about the numbers and what they see is important you know what what basically like right now the way ad agencies work a lot of times is you have a person called a planner and they come up with this idea of what might make a good ad and that works i mean i'm, I'm all for that i know a lot of great planners but also too if you think about advertising it's basically going to come down to three things in the end. It's going to come down to a, a joke of some kind, some sort of comedy, something emotional, a poem, kind of right. It's got to be this thing where we talk about how great the Subaru is and it's poetic, or it's going to come down to information, right? Which is kind of like my pillow guys telling you this stuff, right? So the, the, the weird part is if you think about comedians, they hire people to write jokes and people write jokes for them. But most planners have never written an ad, have never written a joke. So they're the people come up with basically the setups for the joke, right? So you would never, a comedian would never hire somebody to write jokes for them who had never written a joke or hire them to write setups for them, which is kind of what this is, you know, which is sort of what the process is. I believe that that synergy happens because creative people see something in, in something. For instance, one of the projects that I had in one of my classes was um, to take the census, which is this massive amount of data that comes out in America every 10 years. And it's got all kinds of information. It's got poverty levels and how much money people make and whether they own a gun and whether they're what church or what religion they're a part of and stuff like that. So people did all kinds of different interesting things with it. And I proposed that we do a thing, uh, a project called uh, which religion is most likely to shoot you? You know, now, only a creative person would kind of do that, would think, oh, that's interesting. Or, you know, uh, I, I can tell you a real specific project that kind of explains my my thinking, if you want, where I actually executed it. Is that something you'd like to hear? Absolutely. Love you too, Les. Please do. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, this is not the world's greatest ad or joke, but it's a good example of what a, about five years ago, uh, I was freelancing for a small agency in Santa Monica. And we were pitching a t-shirt company. And the t-shirt company uh, is not like we make you one cool t-shirt. They're a $100 million revenue a year business, right? If you, if you if an agency decides to have a party, they make 50 t-shirts and this company does, right? So we had a really good planner. She had been a good bee and she had a, an interesting idea, which was, um, uh, you know, people don't own anything anymore because everything is digital. So if you get a t-shirt from an event, it's a memorial kind of thing. It was, a, it was a good idea, but it wasn't very retail, and this is a very retail company, right? So one of the things I did, and this has sort of evolved into another business I'm interested in, is I was looking around on their website, and I found um, I found that they had this part of this website that if you, if, you, uh, if you bought T-shirts from them, if you ordered T-shirts from them, when the thing was over, they hustled you into this, shuffled you into this sort of comment section where you could say, here's why the company is good, or here's what's wrong, here's what's bad, you know, stuff like that. And then a 98.7 approval rating, they were quite proud of, but it was stuck way back into their website somewhere nobody would ever see, right? And I thought, wow, there's a lot of data there, right? That's interesting. That's the voice of the customer. But when you looked at the, when you looked at the screen, you would see 10 comments, click a page, 
10 comments. And some people didn't leave comments. So this could go on forever. It's not, not kind of usable in that way, right? So what I did was um, I wrote a Python script and I, I thought, let's scrape this off and let's see how many comments there are. And there were like 10,000 comments. They've been doing this for like the last, I don't know, five or 10 years or something, right? That's incredibly valuable information. And, uh, and so I wrote this script and then what do you do with it? Well, you know, there's a lot of Python tools and this is before, particularly for NLP, and this is before all this AI stuff and everything is out. So I used a, a, a Python program called NLTK and I uh, data mined the language, which is sort of a thing I'm really big on, right? So one of the things you can do is a thing called uh, co-occurring words. Now, so what NLTK will give you is co-occurring words. And a co-occurring word is kind of like powerful computer. Those seem to go together, right? I mean, you could say strong computer. It wouldn't be wrong. But, but powerful computer seems to go together, right? So you can ask all this, com you can you know, data mine all this thing, say, hey, give me all the co-occurring co words, right? And, um, and then it gave me this whole list of co-occurring words and how, how many people will comment at these, these words and you can do engrams and things like that, right? So one of the phrases was a uh, quick turnaround, right? Which is sort of interesting, you know, and, and, you know, if you weren't sort of a creative person thinking about that, you know, that immediately sparked a visual in my mind, right? Uh, but what, what the, the insight behind it, since you're an insight person is, what really happens in a company is, let's say you're in an agency and you're going to have a party and you have to get 50 t-shirts, that crappy job goes to the lowest person on the totem pole and, and it's the last thing they think of and you have to make this thing and there's a lot of people depending on you get t-shirts and it's really stressful. So people were very happy that they could do this quick turnaround because they get this job at the last minute, right? So I took that insight and I made an ad, and this is not the world's greatest ad, but it was basically a banner ad that was a picture of a girl with a corporate t-shirt and her back was to you. And then it animated around and turned around and it just said, quick turnaround, guaranteed, right? Not, not the world's not going to win any awards, but you can see how you can take a lot and find a lot of data and mine that data. And now somebody else might have looked at that and not thought anything about that. It wasn't like the number one phrase or whatever, right? And that's what creative people can do. And, and if I could say just one more thing that I think is comes out of that story is I recently read a book, I'm trying to think of the guess name, but it's called uh, Infonomics. It's by a guy from Gardner. And one of the things he talks about is zombie data. And that is zombie data, right? Companies have data worth thousands, millions of dollars maybe, that is just dead inside their agency or inside their company that they got for something else and then don't realize they can use it in some other way. And that's what I did with that data. I mean, it was kind of hidden there. And uh, I recently worked for a real estate company who during COVID uh, interviewed, because everything was so far apart, was on Zoom, they interviewed over 200 potential customers who would call in to find out about the company. So they had 200 hours of um, of of uh, of potential customers talking about what interested them, what they're doing. And I've taken and translated that 200 hours and I'm starting to mind it. It's quite a, a project. Uh, but that sort of thing, then I can turn into ads. And so I've actually created a site uh, just as kind of on a whim. And I use Mid Journey to do these images. So you can see an image I did with Mid Journey of a, of a, a zombie data hunter. So if you go to zombiedatahunter.com, uh, you will see a zombie data hunter. You'll see me on there and this whole idea about how companies have this data. But but it's it's worthless unless you can sort of have that insight that you talk about and say, oh, wow, here's how I could use that. I, I think that's a terrific example. It reminds me of something a long, long time ago working for a big UK um uh, supermarkets, uh, they're Tesco. They're, they're, they're the bit, they're, they're, as it were, the Walmart. They're not Walmart, but they're Tesco. Um, they take one in every eight pounds on the British high street. Um, and I, I remember being handed um, a database that some poor intern had had to type in. Um, and it was a, it, it was, it was a, it was a competition. And it said, my favorite Tesco product is X. And then there was 30 words because. And I did, I did a, I did a kind of, I did a data mining entity extraction job on that. And quite quickly, um, I mean, really using, uh, not not using anything as, as sophisticated as, as NLTK, this was using Excel because it came in an Excel spreadsheet, but, but, but found that there were 
kind of four or five core connotations that allowed us to then build a campaign from that. Um, I think you're so right. It's not inevitable that you're going to go down one direction or another, but it, it's such a useful and such a powerful tool enabling you to to understand what what's the reality underpinning this, and then how can we riff off that? Listen, um, I've uh, inevitably I've got a Columbo question for you. Um, is there is there any way that you work with data um, uh, that I haven't asked you that I should have done? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, no. I mean, I work with tabular data. I work with NLT. I work with NLP data. I'm very interested in zombie data, um, but I also think it doesn't have to be this crazy hard thing. I mean, sometimes it's just like a little thing you hear, you know. And and but if there's no creative person there to make something out of it, it's not heard, or it doesn't. It doesn't seem important, you know. You know, uh, you work with insights, and I'm not the first person to work with insights. But what I believe is, and like how you use that, uh, you know, that that taking data and being able to make something funny or interesting or poetic out of it. And then with all these new tools, I mean, they can do some pretty cool stuff. A lot of GPT, GPT writing is, is kind of B or C essay kind of writing. But it's a good start. It's a good student. I think of it as like a microwave, you know, when the microwave came in, it was super useful. It helped us make things more efficiently and faster and better. It didn't stop people from wanting to be great chefs or great cooks. Great, great, great analogy. Um, do you have any questions for me? Yeah, I'm kind of curious what, what you do. I mean, if you tell me a little bit about what, what you know, with your insightful stuff, because it, this is really what I'm talking about, you know. Sure, of, of course, of course. So, so I, I, I started life um, as a classicist because I was badly taught math at school, uh, and uh, and I and so I fell in love with with story and story structure and uh, and what particularly what the Greeks did. Um, I mean, you know, two and a half thousand years ago, but but they they told some pretty good tales. I then went into the world of corporate communication, and then I got very dissatisfied with the lack of measure. Not that I, I'd been a measurement person at all, but I got I got very dissatisfied with the people doing things on a on a whim and not having any justification for it. And I went back to school and I studied psychology. I did um, experimental psychology uh, and I fell in love with um, using data to tell stories. Now, I was, to begin with, I was terrified, terrified because I'd, I'd ripped up a, a, a big, a big contract with a with a London agency. I'd moved to the sticks. I'd, you know, I, 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 I was, was I shooting myself in the foot? And, and my new life was all about data, but I found this very, very, very powerful tool. And when I bounced back into the world of, uh, of, of communication in 2005, six, uh, having been out for about four or five years, suddenly, while well, Facebook was there, Twitter was about to be born, communications data, uh, well, commu data and communications was becoming important. Um, and because I could do Statistics and statistic isn't isn't hard math. I've got I've got I've got members of my family who are proper mathematicians and physicists. And when I talk about statistics, they they smile gently and pat me on the shoulder or the head and say, "Yeah, yeah, it's not really math." Is it? Anyway, um, <laughs> but but I but it, but boy, is it useful? You know that Tesco example was a, was was an early example. But about a dozen about ten years ago, just under ten years ago, I decided that. To 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 break to break out by myself, um, and I found that um, I had these two abilities. I had these. Uh, I'm not saying I'm the best writer. I'm the I'm the most splendid statistician. Not a bit of it. But I understand the principles that go in both, and I understand how that when the two are put together, they can be very much more powerful than when they're kept apart. Um, and so I spend a lot of my time now. I, I started out being a a data storyteller on behalf of other corporations, corporations that were drowning in data and that were throwing it at their customers and their customers were understandably running for the hills. Um, uh, and I said, look, if we take a more human empathetic um, way of uh, of communicating, a way that allows, uh, that respects their data tolerance, because not everyone's going to have the data tolerance. If you avoid this kind of this curse of knowledge, uh, and you uh, and you use data in a human and judicious way, you're going to be more likely to be able to persuade them. And so I did a lot of that. I now spend a lot more time coaching and training and mentoring people to uh, realize how they can bring these two. You know, if they're more if they're more on the creative side, how can they get an appreciation and an understanding for what the data world can give them? If they're in the data science world, that that 
it's fine to take huge pride in writing the most elegant Python SQL script that you possibly can to solve a problem. But if it's not a problem that's going to have an impact on top or bottom line, well, me, so so it's a, it's it's a, partly the simultaneous translation bit. And, and I just love seeing the, I really got the buzz teaching statistics to psychologists, um, postgraduate psychologists who were crying because they were having to do something they didn't want to do. Um, uh, so I got, I got a real kick out of that. But then when you say, look, if you put it in, put it in here and in here and you ask this question, you're going to be able to find out whether giving them that cup of coffee made them sharper or not. Oh my God! And they they would cry. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't the physical it wasn't the, with joy. It wasn't the physical contact. Um, but they throw that you know I'd be teaching statistics and people would be hugging me at the end of the class. You know, it was a it was, so um, I, I'm not I'm not after you know the hugs. That's absolutely fine. But I, I'm more after that 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 feeling of sharing that feeling of liberation that people can get when they understand that if they bring these two things together, then they can be super smart and they can be super per persuasive. So that's how I got into it. And that's the kind of thing I do. Now, listen, um, can I, can you, I say one thing about that? Yeah, can I say one thing about that? Because I think that's really interesting. And we share that, really. I mean, we, we go at that from different backgrounds and angles, but that is really a lot of what I'm doing. I think there's a couple things to that. One, you know, one of the first things people tell me is that they don't think they can do all this math. And like I say, I was on the math team many years ago, but recently took a test and tested it at the fifth grade level, which is almost, you know, the short bus guy. But, uh, but uh, you know, it's really not that much math in what I do. There is statistics and, and not necessarily very involved statistics, you know? And so uh, I'm no statistical genius, but I do think that keeps people from wanting to do this kind of things. They're so afraid of that. That's a question I get a lot. And then the other thing is, because, you you know, I'm out doing data storytelling in a different way, but that's really also what I'm doing. And, you know, visualizations and things like that. So a commercial can be a visualization. And some people have done that, right? So uh, I think the other thing that I kind of left out that I think why creative people should be using data is right now, a lot of times it's used to kill their ads, to go, well, that's not really true. But it can also be used to sell their Right. To go. I mean, if you come with a good statistic and you go, hey, look, everybody's saying quick turnaround. We need to do something with this. And 450 of your customers are saying that. Here, I did this funny ad for that. You should buy this. It's harder to say no to than if you just present this wild idea. That's. I think that's. I think it's very, very, very exciting. Very exciting to hear. I'm glad. I'm. I'm always glad to meet people who are not. Not who are like minded. We. We. I'm, we. I'm sure we work in very, very different ways. Um. But who see who appre who appreciate that this is not about spoiling people's fun. It's about making it much more fun. Very good. Um. Really good. Listen. So we'll we'll definitely point people to zombiedatahunter.com. Um. Where else can our listeners and viewers find out about you and your work online, Les? So less guessing, L E S G U E S S I N G dot com, and that's one S. And uh, people ask me if Les is short for Lester or Leslie, and I tell them it's short for lesbian. My parents really wanted a girl, but uh, <laughs> and uh, there's a whole long story behind my name, but that is legally my name. Well, actually, my name, my real, my legal name is Les That Guessing because that's what I help people do. But you can go to lessguessing.com. And also, a lot of that's more my advertising work sort of stuff for rock copyright and stuff. But in, a, in addition to zombiedatahunter.com, uh, zombie data hunter, yeah, I just sort of put that up there and bought that. Uh, but also, uh, if you go to creativealgorithm.org, creativealgorithm.org, it's actually a site I made about five years ago and haven't updated, but it's very much my approach to data mining and NLP. And I sort of got moved into other areas. So I haven't updated it in a long time. But uh, creativealgorithm.org is a place that can see my stuff. Or LinkedIn. Tremendous. We will include all of those in the show notes. Um, listen, uh, we're like, uh, thank you so much, Les, for, for sharing your approach to using Data Smarter. I think it's fair to say that if there were only more people with your approach to taking data to underpin creativity, there'd be very much less malarkey in the world of marketing <laughs> communication and very much more data common sense. Les Guessing, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Sam. This has been fun. I really appreciate it. Good to connect with you. Thanks so much for listening to Data Malarkey, the podcast about using data smarter. To find out what kind of data storyteller you are, why not take our data storytelling scorecard? 
It takes just two minutes to complete and will give you a personalized report right away. Visit data-storytelling.scoreapp.com or follow the link in the show notes.